Hey, so good morning. And Craig, welcome to Bro Talk. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. Uh, yeah, lovely Friday morning with the winds in Mallorca. Uh, another day off for you, or is it a morning off? No, it's a morning off. It's a morning <laughs> off, so noon, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> for the listeners, Craig gets a lot of stick because we don't actually believe he works because he has spends a lot of time sending football messages in the group chat. Is that right, Craig? It is, yeah. I just like to keep everyone active and on their toes and make sure that we have a good communication within each other. It's very well observed that Craig doesn't work as much as others, let's say. But uh, let's just say I use my time wisely. It's uh, time wisely. Yeah, but it's what you put in. <laughs> I'd say if the GDP's got down from Yorker, you're a huge part of it. But, hey, sorry? The GDP's decreased from Yorker, you're a big reason why. People not working and responding to your text messages. One certain history teacher whose name will not be mentioned. Anyway, hey, tell us a bit about your background. What brought you over to Mallorca, family, what you do, work. So, yeah, I'm originally from the Midlands in England, a town called Nuneaton. And basically, I just finished college, didn't feel ready to go to university. So I thought I'd come over and do a, a year or two out of studying. And ended up in Mallorca working in the hotel, doing family entertainment, and then just pretty much ended up staying longer term. I've been here for 21 years now. So, wow. Mallorca is a lovely island. And if anyone's ever been to the meeting, they'd probably understand why I made that decision. <laughs> and your family? Oh, yeah, my family is still in the meeting. My mum and my two sisters, they all work in schools. My dad has been working in a factory making car parts for different brands of cars for as long as I can remember. They're the kind of people that will, they like to go away, but they're very much based in Neaton. Okay. They've always thought the idea of moving away would be good, but they'll uh, they'll never do it. If they're too settled where they are. And naturally, you've got your own family, so tell us about them. Your boss and the dark girls. You've got your own family, so tell us about them. <laughs> so yeah, I've got, I met my wife. Sarah, she came over the same year to start working here in the same hotel. So we met that first year and then the relationship blossomed. <laughs> um, and we ended up staying and getting married and having two, two wonderful girls. And their age is great. The eldest is 13 and Abigail, the youngest, she's just uh, 10. Okay. So approaching the teenage years. Yeah, I can definitely feel that. Although I do think with, with Isabella, it could be a lot worse. Quite happy at the moment. Touch wood, I'm probably jinxing it now. <laughs> but from other teenagers that I've seen with my work, I do see quite a lot working with them and then coming into the, the to where I work and everything. She's not too bad. So, <laughs> yeah, she's be a lot worse. Yeah. She's lovely. Uh, and tell us about your work, Craig. Where do you work? I work at... I work at Palmer Jump, which is a trampoline park in just on the outskirts of Palmer. Been there since we opened in 2016. Worked very hard there almost every day. <laughs> no messages or WhatsApp usage while I'm there either. No, it's really good. So I've got a lot of responsibility there. Being there from when we opened, seeing how it's grown and become sort of one of the most well-known attractions in Mallorca, I'd like to say I've had a big part of that, so I'm very proud of that. And yeah, it's good. We, as I mentioned previously, we do work with a lot of teenagers, what, 16, 17-year-olds coming in for their first job. So you're trying to get them to understand work life, how it is in the workplace, working with other people that might be older that you don't get on with and helping them understand that it's completely different to what it is at school and starting on starting them on the path to adulthood. Yeah, it's very happy. I'm very, I feel very fortunate to be in the position I'm in. Yeah, sure, in a very influential position, I'd say, and also from an observation point of view, because I imagine, Craig, what you do, you can see the different dynamics in regards to how children behave, respond, interact, also family dynamics. What, what have you observed over the years in terms of family dynamics changes and also regards to children today, young people, so ages from 8 to 13, 14? Has there been a significant shift in any way? I think every generation does the same. I remember with, 
my grandma or my grandparents and then my parents, they always say, oh, the, this generation has it easy and they're completely different to the previous generation or their generation. And I think with this generation now, I think we're just going through the same thing. We say, oh, we would never have done that in our generation or oh, they've got it so easy. They've got access to this and that. I, I do think this generation has it a lot tougher than what my generation did. I think the influence on social media is huge. Children are almost forced to be things that social media and influencer are, are, are telling them they should be. And I think the pressure on them from social media, from influencers, it passes down then to their friends. And as a parent, it's, it's very difficult. I think we've had this conversation before that I felt that although my parents had and my grandparents had a, obviously a big influence on who I am, yeah. I think it's more with the group of friends that you're part of. They, they have a major influence on the decisions you make, especially in those teenage years as you're becoming a young adult. So they, the decisions you make there are influenced more by your friends than your parents. I think you're always going to have that early teen period where the, the, the child thinks if you tell them one thing, they're going to do the complete opposite. That, that's always going to happen. And so I do think that the friends has a, a big influence on that. And I think social media and these influences they have even more influence than what we would have had. We didn't have access to social media or anything like that. We, we communicated by phoning each other up off the landline or yeah. actually went round to see each other physically. I think there's less and less of that because the contact they have with each other, it's over WhatsApp, it's over Instagram, it's over Twitter, whatever platform they use and how they look and how they behave. Everything is not because they want to do it necessarily, it's to get more likes, more impressions, more followers. So it's something I don't fully understand, but working where I work and obviously with marketing, Palma Jump and our products, we have to target that type of age group anyway because they're our main target. So we do a lot of videos and try and make as many posts that would relate to them as we possibly can. But in regards to how it's changed... Of course, the attitudes have changed. Societies can change, has changed completely from not even in a generation. You're talking five or six years ago. And I do think social media has a massive influence on that. The things people are doing now, you watch some of the videos just to get likes. Um, and to be honest, when you look at some of them, you think you, you really struggle to know what's real and what's fake now. Yeah. I think you can come across a video and I, I don't fully understand, but I think I take it for what it is. And then it turns out that it was fake, it was all staged. Or, so it's very difficult to know the difference now when you're watching these types of videos. And for children, I'm 40, so if I'm struggling, children 13, 14, they're going to believe what they see. I, I, yeah. So that has that does have a massive bearing. Yeah, I totally understand what you're saying and what you're thoughts are coming from and with that in mind Craig do you notice any differences between boys and girls who with social media is there a, a different approach a different response I can we try and protect Isabella as much as we can she has access to a phone but we try and limit as to what she has access to on her phone she doesn't have Facebook she doesn't have any social media really the only thing she has to contact her friends is WhatsApp and what we find on WhatsApp is that with a written message, it, it can be taken so many different ways. People can read into it any way that they want to. Some people might think that they're being, when they write something down or send a message via WhatsApp, the person that's writing it is using it in a completely different way than what the, other, the person that's reading it is interpreting it. So that trying to get Isabella to understand that it has been challenging over the last year because she can take things quite personally at times. When things are being put on groups, Isabella's straight away thinking that she's got to be on there to respond, and it's not the case. A person's not putting a, a message on a group specifically for Isabella to respond. It's there yeah. for the whole group to yeah. respond. And if it's not aimed at you and you don't know what the answer is or if it's not targeted to you, then try not to get involved. For us, as parents, we've try to make sure that at the end of the, essentially she's 13 years old, which in our eyes is still young. 
and we feel that she's not the right age to have access to those types of platforms, especially with you, when you see the, the the types of comments that are being put on. So again, people can send what they want on these open platforms and it can be very hurtful, especially if someone is taking it the wrong way. Yeah. From as regards to the difference between boys and girls, it's difficult for me to, to be able to say purely because I don't have any boys. And so I'm more thinking about your observation from in Palmer Jump, do you see them interacting or what goes on in groups? Is there a difference there? Not really. Not from what I can tell. The staff that we have or have had at Palmer Jump over the years, the group that we've got now, there's a couple of new members that we've got in recently. And it always takes a time for them to settle in. There's people that have been there for six or seven years, but they generally they settle in very well. But in terms of their attitudes within work, there's not really any difference. There's some male members that you struggle, that you seem to always have to be on to make sure that they're doing what they need to be doing or doing it correctly. But at the same time, we've had girls like that over the years as well. So I don't think there's too much difference, in my opinion anyway, from okay. working with them. There doesn't seem to be too much difference between the attitudes between boys and girls. They, 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 as regards to characters and everything, they, they're very similar anyway. They find similar things funny. So yeah, personally, I can't see a difference or a big difference. So you're in a managerial position at part of the job. Do people ever go to you if they're struggling personally or at work? Need someone they can confide in? Yeah, I mean, we have had moments where staff members have been struggling with things within work with other members of staff, but also outside of work, whether that be personally, financially, emotionally. And I like to think that we've always tried to help them as best we can. Obviously, as well, the management team, we want to make sure that the staff are coming to work and that they're in the right frame of mind because if they're not, then they're not able to represent Palmer Jump in its best way, especially with the staff members such as uh, the monitors. The amount of birthday parties we have at Palmer Jump, it's the monitors that are in contact with the parents, with the children. So if they're not in the right headspace, it's, defi- it's very difficult for them to give the best service, let's say. Yeah, to the people that have booked birthdays. And at the end of the day, the birthday, birthday party is a very special occasion. The children, they're seven, eight years old. They come into Palmer Jump with all their friends. It's a massive thing for the children. And we yeah. try and enforce that the monitors are aware of that and try and get them to remember what they were like when they were that age and how excited they were. They're going to be running around and screaming yeah. and shouting. And we try and encourage the staff to be involved with that party because it is big, it's such a big occasion. And so I like to think that they do that a lot of the time. If they didn't, then we wouldn't be as successful as we are. But as we're saying, it's important for the staff members to be in the right frame of mind to be able to do that. And so if there's been moments where a member of staff is feeling a bit under pressure, that my door is always open when I'm there. The door is open so they can come and speak to me. And there's been times where they've said, look, Craig, I'm not really feeling in the right headspace. Do you mind if I don't do any birthdays today or have as little contact, let's say, with the customers as possible? And we've dealt with that as best we can. And how do you develop that trust, Craig? The fact that they feel comfortable to go to you and say, Craig, I'm not in the best play headspace today. Do you mind if I don't work with the, the birthday parties? That's a brave thing to do. I think it's a case of being approachable. I think as part of the management, you have to have a separation with the staff. So you can't, as, as much as you want to be kind and friendly towards the staff, you have to have that separation for the staff to understand that at the end of the day, you are management. Because then if not, then if there is a time you ever need to say something to them, then it, it becomes more difficult. Yeah, but you have to be approachable and you have to have a good relationship with the staff. And for me, it's always been a case of I'm not going to ask a member of staff to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So the staff see me, I've done birthday parties myself, I've covered in the park, reception, quite hands on with things like that. And I'm always, I feel, I'd like to think anyway, that I'm always willing to help in, in a member of staff 
in whatever they need help with. So I think that helps. And like I say, the most important part for me is that you want to feel as if someone, they can come to you and talk to you in regards to anything, whether it's something to do with work um, or something that they need to get off their chest regarding their personal issues. And where does Craig go? Because over the years I've known you, I think I can count no more than on one hand the times I've even seen you close to losing it. You always seem very calm. It's controlled. Um, but even on the football pitch. So how do you, like your human being, like all of us, you must have your challenging times and stressful times. How do you manage that, Craig? It's just being comfortable within yourself. I think that's what being happy with what you have and understanding that there's whatever troubles that you have going on in your life, there's people that are in a much more difficult situation than what you are. I think for me, I've, I've always felt that I've been very fortunate here, being able to have a job that allows me to work all year round, which working here for so long, working in the hotels where it is seasonal based, understanding that. So I'm very fortunate with the position that I've got. I'm well aware of that. I've got an amazing wife, two wonderful girls. So I know I'm very fortunate in that aspect as well. Yeah. And I've got a group of friends that we socialize as much as we can. We play football once a week. We have charity events and we try and arrange to meet up as much as we can. We do. We go out with drinks. So I know in that aspect as well, I've got a good group of friends. So I think that essentially is what I, I, I feel that when I get in my head, if, if I'm a little bit lost or a bit down or yeah. a bit stressed, I think going back to any of those things, mainly I'd say with my family, seeing the girls grow and develop and seeing them being comfortable in them, themselves, their selves as well. I think that's a big thing with Isabella. She's at, oh, which is the high school now. So yes. she had last year, it was her first year. So it's a lot of, it's a lot different to what she was used to. So seeing her adapt so well was very good. And seeing her happy as well. Obviously, she had she's a, a teenage girl, so she's going to have fallouts and yeah. dramas along the way. And it's just trying to help her and to to come out of that as best she can. And regarding to Abigail, she's Abigail, she's very playful. She's still very young, but she's seen her develop and her enjoying. She's into tennis, so seeing her develop and, and improving so much of that, I think is, yeah. is for me, like I sit there and watch and it's just compared to where she was two or three months ago and then before that and seeing her, how much she enjoys it, I can just sit there and watch for hours. So I think those aspects and then on a personal level, playing football is or having any kind of sport has always been my love. I would literally sit and watch anything sport wise as so playing football or playing sport is always for me been the best thing but watching sport is a close second okay hey craig there are times whereby it's after a football match where a different social occasion i occasionally get a glimpse of you the internal clocks going you're thinking you just go within yourself for a moment and then you come back out is that you reflecting on what we're talking about the game itself or that's your mind escape into a problem that you may be ad addressing outside of the, the context that you're in. When I go within myself and I just yeah, sit there I sometimes see you reflecting. Yeah, um, I suppose after a fo after football on a Tuesday, I, I do like to sit and analyse a lot that's gone on. I suppose I'd like to analyse every aspect, whether it be work or in the family or with football or sport. I, I do analyse a lot of it. I think it's a way of, not that I'm ever going to improve at football, but it's too late for me now. But it is a good way of making those self improvements. You know, what you could have, the, the decisions that you make, could I have made a different decision in that moment? How can I make it better the next time? What can we do differently? Sitting down or thinking about that straight after, I think it's always, for me anyway, been the best time because then you've got, um, You've, you've literally just lived it so you can go back over it and it's quite fresh but a lot of the time it's just it's probably just me just analysing the football from the Tuesday to be honest because I believe there's a strong correlation between reflection like whatever we're reflecting about and how it does improve our mental well-being 
Um, as long as we don't overthink and then use it to beat ourselves up, see there's a healthy way of doing it and a non-healthy way. Um, but I think sometimes in the business of life, a lot of us don't get the time just to sit down and reflect and pause. And to me, that's part of your, as you said, self-improvement. And you said that you can't improve the problem at your age. I do believe you can in terms of your resilience of the game, decision-making, there may be physical aspects in terms of speed that we can't improve on, but football's more than speed. So there's definitely aspects that you can still continue to to try and progress. Craig, it's always a pleasure. It's a privilege for me to get to know you over the last few years, particularly the last two or three. I know you as a person, I know you less as a husband, but I do know you more as a dad. In what you, everything I, you do, you put your heart into it. And you are, for me, a, a template for, for young boys out there, if, whether they've got dads or it's more important you haven't got a dad. And your heart to reach out and support other men with other capacity in it any capacity doesn't go unnoticed. So thank you for who you are and what you're doing and may it continue. Thank you. Thank you, Gary.